Managing Violence Podcast, episode 86. We're talking security industry defensive tactics with Nick Wyborn. The Managing Violence Podcast is proud to be partnered with Fuji Sports. Fuji Sports manufactures the highest quality of judo, jiu jitsu, and MMA gear. Everything from geese to rashies, shorts, gloves, pads, bags, mats, finger tape, everything you could possibly need for training. I've personally been a customer and supporter of Fuji Sports dating back to my very first BJJ gi in 2007. Since then, they've been a go-to brand for me, whether I was chasing judo gear, BJJ gear, MMA gear, or just convenient bags to carry everything around in. The gi I wear to Krav Maga training now is actually a Fuji Sakai. Uh, it's one of the most comfortable and most durable gis I've ever owned. And yes, they even come in black for the ninjas in the audience. As a listener of the show, simply enter the discount code MVP10 at checkout for 10% off your order, and a percentage of the sale will also go to the show to keep us on the air. Savings for you, commission for us. What's not to love about that? Uh, MVP10 for 10% off at fujisports.com or fujisports.com.au for the Aussies. Some exclusions apply. Thank you, Fuji Sports, for years of high-quality gear and for supporting the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Managing Violence podcast. I'm your host, Joe Saunders. On this show, we seek to equip you with the knowledge and skills to be able to manage violence no matter who you are. We are hashtag for the protectors. If you are a protector by mindset, a protector by profession, or a protector in any other way, we are here for you. And speaking of protectors, my guest today is Mr. Nicholas Wyborn. Nick has a long career both in the security industry, in law enforcement, and then back in the private sector as well. Uh, Nick has a lot of insight coming from a martial artist into real world violence and and how that transition happened for him. And some of the learnings he had going from the private security industry into law enforcement and then back into the private sector. He's written a fantastic book for security professionals called Defensive Tactics for Security Professionals. And we're gonna be talking a lot about that book. If you like the show, please remember you can get bonus content for this and every other episode at patreon.com forward slash managing violence or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash Joe MVP. Don't forget, my book is also available on Amazon. Uh, uh, Neon Jungle, about his true tales of lessons, laughs and lacerations. Yes, I almost forgot the title of my own book, perhaps too many head knocks. Anyway, uh, here we go with the interview with Mr. Nicholas Wyborn. I'm joined here on the Managing Violence podcast by Nick Wyborn. Nick, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Joe. Real pleasure. But it is a unusual situation to have someone on the podcast in the same time zone as me. So for, for both of us, it is early morning, nearly always. It's me early morning, someone else's afternoon, or me late at night, someone else's morning. It's uh, it's it's a pleasant it's pleasant to speak to a fellow Aussie who's uh, who's only a couple hundred kilometers away. So, uh, mate, the, the, <laughs> thanks for indulging me. I guess into not having to do complicated time zone calculations. Oh, you're welcome. Nick, uh, you and I have known each other for oh God, probably over a decade uh, through through various seminars and courses and things that, that we, uh, we were both part of. Uh, you were kind enough to send me a copy of your book, which is uh, Defensive Tactics for Security Professionals, uh, which came out just recently uh, during the the uh, the lockdown or the COVID quarantine lockdown period in history where many people started podcasts and wrote books because suddenly people had extra time. So uh, it's a, it should, should be a prolific time in human history of the amount of stuff that's been created, hopefully. But um, Nick, uh, uh, the whole focus of the conversation for today is going to be talking about defensive tactics in the security industry. And in particular, in the context of the Australian security industry, as we were talking offline about it is it is slightly different uh, in a country like Australia versus perhaps the US. We we probably have more in common with countries like the UK and maybe Canada, where there's similar sort of legal structures in place. Uh, but that said, I think there's a there's a lot of value that we can we can sort of dive into when it comes to defensive tactics for uh, what we call enforcement professionals who don't have as much authority as perhaps a, a law enforcement officer does. So there's that's, that's probably what we'll talk about for the majority of the of the conversation, but Let's start off with an introduction to you. Let's. Uh, what, what's your journey into this space? What's your background uh, that led to you writing the book? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, Joe, I started uh, started martial arts quite young. I think I was about eleven or twelve at the time. Um, boxing, I think, was first on the list. And uh, I remember very early on being put in the ring with a a nineteen year old. I think I was about eleven or twelve, and 
of course, I got knocked out, uh, and uh, you know, I learned a lot from that. But I thought, yeah, not real keen on getting knocked out. So, <laughs> turned to uh, you know martial arts. Started exploring the martial arts, and I originally found Taekwondo um, and a couple of other things along that that vein. Um, took me to about uh, eighteen when I started working as a uh, doorman, uh, as a bouncer, and worked out quickly that the skills that I'd learned um, were not transferable to the work that I was doing. Um, and that all, I guess, culminated in one incident that happened in a, a local nightclub where I was uh, you know, pinned in an alcove. And uh, you know, I think I write about it in the book. And uh, I realised in that point in time that I had very little skills to do with that thread in that moment. Um, and that was kind of a life life defining moment right there. So I then went out and began a journey of searching for, um, you know, more relevant tactics and techniques. And, um, you know, I guess my career just kind of followed suit. I, uh, I joined the police force, New South Wales Police Force when I was 23. Um, still quite young, fairly naive, but had a pretty good uh, skill set kind of going in, um, you know, which is I've done some training with the ISR and some combatives and a few other things. So um, had a really good career in law enforcement, was uh, quite fortunate to um, to get into a specialist unit called the Weapons and Tactics Training Unit, which was based out of uh, Golden Police Academy, which is the largest police academy in Australia. Um, and I learned a lot in that role. I learned a lot from uh, senior guys ahead of me, guys from the, the TAU and things like that. And very early on, uh, I think it was you know, maybe my first year in the job, I uh, traveled to the US just wanting more. And yeah, I did some really good, really good training in the US around 2010. Um, I came back and I uh, was lucky to become a, a yeah, weapons and tactics trainer. Um, and went back to the US again, learned some other good stuff. I left the, the police after about, uh, about five and a bit years. And uh, yeah, I had a little bit of, bit of, as I mentioned, security experience before that. So went back to doing a little bit of security. Um, became a security trainer and uh, kind of been doing that for a few years. And I guess, uh, yeah, I guess you know, the rest is history. Um, yeah, I've had some other, other things that I've, I've been doing. Um, I was in the military for about a minute, um, spent about nine months in the Australian Army Reserve uh, and then started my business. So uh, started a gym and a martial arts center and went from being quite free and flexible to you know, then working 100 hours a week for myself. So um, no time to uh, parade or do anything. So uh, yeah, but fast forward to today, um, you know, I still run a martial arts studio. I teach a system called uh, Kapap under Major Avinadia um, over in the US. And uh, also a, a on-call firefighter, which I, I quite enjoy. Awesome, man. There's a, there's a lot to unpack there, but uh, so, I'd like to go back to uh, to that, that first learning curve of of going from being sort of I guess recreational martial artist to eighteen years old on the doors. All of a sudden, this is real life. Um, you, you actually have to apply this stuff, and you and you're identifying training gaps at real to, in real time. And uh, and I mean, your story and my story are very very similar uh, in 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 that aspect. And and to me, it was it was that time working on the doors that opened my eyes to all the things that I didn't. I didn't yet know about about uh, how to manage violence, but um, let's talk a little bit first before we go into the the gaps in your martial arts. Talk us through what the actual defensive tactics training was to get your security license to become a security guard, because a, a lot of uh, a lot of people are probably obl oblivious to what that training looks like. So, what, what was that experience for you? What was that training for you? Uh, look, I think at the time, um, you know, in New South Wales, I think uh, the security course was about one week. Um, I didn't do any defensive tactics training whatsoever before uh, before working the door. So it was kind of like uh, like bringing lambs to the slaughter, so to speak. Um, yeah, absolutely zero. I had some really, really great instructors at the time um, in the industry, and it was no discredit to them. Just the way that the training packages were set up, they were very theory-based, um, theory-heavy, and there was just no defensive tactics at that time. Yeah, uh, you you and I came in around about the same time, or about the same age, and uh, and got into the industry around the same time. I was in Queensland, and uh, and my defensive tactics training was one day, uh, and I and I believe we covered a, a transport wrist lock or the gooseneck wrist lock, as some might know it. We covered a, a straight arm bar escort, 
uh, and we covered uh, a shoulder pin or the the, the uh, lateral vascular neck restraint, I think, in the literature, uh, which is a standing arm triangle for anyone who might know that terminology better. And that was basically it. <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. We had a palm heel strike to the sternum. We had a hit and spin, and uh, that was basically it. So, and 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 realistically, we had a whole day. Uh, so, one day. So, probably about four hours of actual training uh, in between the theory and uh, and a whole bunch of uncoordinated gimps that that really couldn't do it anyway. So, um, <laughs> unless you had an actual background in in martial arts or in the ability to defend yourself in some way, whether it's yeah, just you grew up scrappy or whatever, uh, you, that course did very little to prepare you for the reality of of working on a door. If you were going to work at an airport or work at a you know, in loss prevention or something where you're just literally observing and reporting, then it probably would have been sufficient. But if you're going out to work in a uh, a, a nightclub or a pub environment where you're going to be dealing with angry people, then uh, the training is was pretty much yeah, nil. Uh, so for you, I mean, you came in basically with a kickboxing skill set, right? With you know, Taekwondo, a bit of boxing, some striking martial arts. Uh, had you started doing Japanese Jiu-Jitsu at that point? No, no, not back then. Cool. So so you basically had a lot of striking skills. How, how did you find, what were the gaps that you identified when you started dealing with real violence having come from that background? Yeah, look, certainly the, the emotion. Uh, I had never been taught to deal with the emotion uh, of, of violence. Um, so I remember that hitting me quite hard. I, I remember being on the door uh, and being that nervous that, um, you know, my knee would shake uh, physically, would, my knee would tremble and, you know, several times um, where, I, you know, I, I did fear for my life. Um, you know, we had, um, we had, you know, bikies and things in at the time and, um, you know, I just had very little, very little skills that, that you know, helped me deal with that. It was more the, uh, you know, the intent of violence, the intent of somebody truly wanting to, to hurt you or kill you um there's nothing that had prepared me that up until that point um so that was probably the the biggest shock was the psychological shock uh of it all trying to 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 think and function um you know in that environment and i guess adrenaline you know can be your best friend sometimes but um yeah there was certainly a, a lack of uh a lack of skill and knowledge um in that area at that time so how did you overcome that? I mean, did you did you have a mentor who could help you with it? Is it something you just decided to to try and battle on your own? Like, how did how did you overcome that that fear? Yeah, I think initially, Joe, I had um, I, I did have some uh, some skills that I had attained um, from from quite a different um, quite a different area, I guess. If I could paint a bit of a picture, I was I was born quite sick as a child. I was born eleven and a half weeks premature. Um, I weighed two pound fourteen ounces. Uh, pneumothorax collapsed lung and a few other things so I was quite a very sick baby was lucky to to even see this world initially to begin with um, my mother nearly died on the table having me so um, as a child I developed a asthma from a very early age bronchitis um, and as a, as a toddler going through through childhood would have regular asthma attacks I was constantly attached to a nebulizer I'd be taking uh, you know just just had a horrible horrible time basically as a child and my poor mother and father who must have been up every night with me um you know doing postural drainage and, and things like that just to kind of help me breathe um you know and then as I started to get older I started to realize that certainly in my teens that when I had an asthma attack if I was out somewhere and had an asthma attack um you know generally what would happen is I would fall to the ground because uh, I couldn't breathe um I'd start to hyperventilate and then you know, it would require an adult to come and take me back to, to get either my medication or to the hospital, whichever was nearer. But as I started to get a bit older, I started to realise that I had had a little bit of control um, over myself. And I worked out that if I controlled my breathing um, just that little bit and kept my heart rate down, it would open up my prefrontal cortex or the part of my brain that could help me think. And then I could make some sound decisions about getting to that phone booth or getting to that um, adult or parent over there who could then help uh, provide me with that, that further care. So I guess I learned to regulate my own breathing and stay really, really calm um, from a very early age. And that all came from, I guess, being, being quite ill with, with those respiratory conditions. It's interesting. It's, it's such a common trope, you know, the, so, some of the martial arts legends of our, 
of our history that they start off with, oh, he was a sickly child. <laughs> like, and 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 it's it's just interesting how often that's repeated. Um, what what I'm curious about is, I mean, you and I probably have both seen uh, in the security industry that the number of people that come in unprepared and they don't last six months, right? They they spend two or three grand getting licensed, getting trained, getting licensed, you know, getting a job. And then the first time someone raises their voice at them and they realize, and they bottle it to, to use a, to use a UK term and they, they can't live it down anymore. So they find a reason to go do something else. Now they go drive for Uber or they, you know, they, they, they find another gig um, that, that gets them out of that conflict zone. So, I mean, I'm curious for you, what was it that made you decide to stick around, even though obviously this was a, a fairly unpleasant experience often enough, why, why stick around? You had other, other opportunities. Yeah, yeah, certainly did. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd done a trade when I was quite young and I had other opportunities, but um, I think that I enjoyed the challenge of, of testing myself. Um, I certainly had a very deep calling to, um, you know, to protect and serve, which which has then transpired in other ways through my life. But um, I guess helping people has always been at the core of, of who I am and, and what I want to do. And I guess getting into the security industry was just, a vehicle or possibly the first vehicle that I found where I could actually do that. Mm, very cool. Very cool. So let's have a fast forward a little bit. I mean, you, you leave the security industry, uh, you go into, you go into law enforcement, you end up as a, as a trainer, uh, operational safety trainer, weapons and tactics, defensive tactics, whatever terminology our listeners are, are familiar with. Uh, you're, you're training police officers and how, and how to uh, manage violent or resisting subjects. Uh, you, you've obviously expanded your own training through Japanese Jiu-Jitsu, ISR Matrix, Kapap, um, you know, other other courses and seminars. You, you're you're one of the uh, the frequent the frequent faces on a seminar, no matter where in the country it was. I saw saw you regularly. There was always the, the core group of us that seemed to appear everywhere. Uh, so I mean, obviously, you had a you had a passion for for learning. What were some of the interesting aspects as you went from being someone who was used to managing? Uh, violence or confrontation in a security context to then transitioning to law enforcement? What were some of the things that, that were different for you in that space? Yeah, look, I think initially uh, starting in general duties, which is where all, every single police recruit begins, um, I felt fairly confident uh, going working in that environment. There were certainly new skills to learn, um, you know, arms and appointments, tactical options, all those types of things. But um, I felt fairly confident in my own uh, skill set and abilities at that time and certainly my ability to communicate and de-escalate and and so forth where you know I found that um, you know not all of my peers possess those same um, those same traits so uh, look that certainly that certainly helped but um, yeah look there was a, a, a certainly a, a divide um, law enforcement work being being quite different um, you're in you know uncontrolled environments you don't get to choose the location that you fight generally um that's that's dictated by the you know by the offenders um you don't get to dictate how many people are in that in those fights um and then of course you yeah as i said you've got all those other considerations those arms and appointments and things like that to to now consider you've got to retain all those you've got to think what what happens if they're taken away from me um you know there's now a there's now a firearm at every single job that i go to because i bring it um, so going from an unarmed situations in pubs and nightclubs where, you know, the chance of someone being armed, probably not that great to now working in law enforcement where there is the possibility of, of being shot at every single job you attend, um, you know, hence, hence where I wore a, uh, a vest. So, um, yeah, it was, it was different on many levels. Mm, mm. In terms of the, uh, the extra resources as well. I mean, this, this is something that, um, uh was was confronting to me when I was uh, when I was young in the in the security industry in particular, uh, where you, know, you, you if you're working as part of a large team, you're working at a, at a large venue where you've got you know 15, 20 guys on potentially if it's a, if it's a really big place, uh, versus when you're working completely on your own, <laughs> there's there's no one is coming, and uh, especially especially the, some of the places I worked, police were not prioritising callouts to that particular venue. Right, and and we're quite happy to tell me they weren't prioritising the call out to that venue because they knew who was involved and didn't really want to deal with it. Uh, and uh, so, so you've got to manage things on your own when when you're you're in that security role, and and maybe help will come. Uh, 
uh, depending on your relationship with local police and you know how enthusiastic the, the duty manager is to actually call them, uh, because quite often managers will or venue venue management will resist calling the police for as long as possible because it doesn't look good for the for the reputation of the venue. Yep. Uh, so there's there's all those sort of complicating factors. I guess uh, one one of the things that I learned uh, <laughs> the the hard way, I guess, accidentally was um, I worked at a venue that uh, was was really bad. Like it was it was really bad. And uh, we we used to pay uh, special duties police to be there, so we 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 had a uh, an arrangement to uh, after between midnight and three a.m. we close at two a.m. So between midnight and three a.m. we we would have uh, one paddy wagon and two cops that we paid for uh, that would be there, literally just so that we didn't have to wait when we when we had we needed someone arrested, we could take them out, get them cuffed, get them thrown in the back of the paddy wagon, and and that was kind of that because we were just so often having assaults. Um, yeah, serious. Like whether it was trespass or whether it was serious assaults or whatever, right? It was just so frequent that we knew if we called the police, it was going to be half an hour, forty minutes. So we'd have to restrain someone until they arrived. So if we just paid them to be there, then that was easier. But the benefit of that was also that if if uh, if police called other police for backup, the response time was like three minutes, <laughs> as, as opposed to half an hour when we called them for for, for backup. So uh, that that was a that was a benefit that we kind of hacked the system a little bit by. Uh, yeah, we also built a good relationship with the local police then because it was usually the, the same core group that were doing the gen, doing the uh, the special duties, yeah. and uh, and they were they started to get a little bit more familiar with us and the the kind of kind of crap we we're dealing with. <laughs> so so there was, a, there was a little bit more empathy or or even sympathy for for our role. But um, let's talk talk a little bit more about defensive tactics because uh, my my experience and and yeah, please correct me if it doesn't map to yours, but. My experience was that the the more useful guards that I worked with typically had some sort of background beforehand, uh, whether it be martial arts, even you know, playing footy, <laughs> playing playing rugby, rugby league, something like that. Without uh, a little bit more comfortable with a bit of contact, they were comfortable with a bit of physicality. The problem was uh, that in the security industry, in particular, the nightclub industry, it tends to be mostly young males, right? So most of our most of our cohort are eighteen to thirty. Uh, th- by the time you get to 30, you start to wonder like, uh, why are you wasting your life here? <laughs> right. But so you're mostly 18 and 20, 18 to, to mid twenties, probably. Uh, and the yeah, testosterone is high aggression's a bit high. And, and if your only skill set is either punching on on a rugby field or, uh, or, or kickboxing, for example, uh, then you tend to get yourself into some legal trouble. Uh, or, or at the very least, you have to answer some uncomfortable questions. Uh, what was your experience as a predominantly as a striker coming into those environments and and yeah, navigating that risk? Uh, yeah, look, that's a great great question, Joe. Um, you know, to this day, hand over heart, I can still say that I've never punched anyone uh, operationally. Um, so you know, striking, even though my skill base was striking, it was it was not something that I relied upon um, ever. Really, um, obviously, you know, moving into to law enforcement and things, there were strikes that formed part of our defensive tactics training. But um, you know, punching and, and kicking people and stuff—it's it's never been my way. Um, you know, I think the art, the art in martial arts is being able to control the person um, without really doing them harm. And you know, I guess that's very different to, you know, coming from a self-defense situation where, you know, you're defending your life or the life of, of of a loved one. Um, and I think I mentioned in the book, the difference between fighting for control and fighting for your life, but certainly when fighting for control, which is, you know, 99% of the time what you're doing in security and law enforcement, um, you know, I don't, I don't believe there is really a need to, to, to do a lot of striking. I've, I've managed to get through without it, um, you know, quite, quite well. Mm. Um, you know, there is a time and a place to use those distraction techniques, but I think the real skill in the art is in, being able to control the person without doing them harm. And I mean, we should, you know, I look at us as, as being very similar to, you know, the medical profession where, you know, do, do no further harm. Um, if, if it's possible to do that, then, then, you know, we're, we're really obliged to do that. Um, you know, I still to this day don't teach people how to fight. If people come to my, my martial arts class and my studio and they want to learn how to fight, I, I send them up the road. There's a lot of people who do that way better than I do. Um, I'll teach them how to live. But yeah, I've I've never uh, really uh, kind of been into that. I think um, you know, I think at your core, you've really got to want to help people. Um, 
you know, and not hurt them. And that's that was always my goal, even when arresting the most violent of offenders. Um, within my nature, there is no malice there to do anybody any harm. Um, you know, if I have to, I will, of course, if I need to defend myself or, or my partner or, you know, um, they up their, their, their level of aggression, yeah, I'll match that and I'll, I'll go further. But um, certainly I think at your heart and core, um, we should be, should be helping to save life, not, um, you know, not training to take it. I think if you're, if you're training in those striking arts, you know, punching and kicking and, uh, you know, and they certainly have a place, um, but, you know, you, get very, you can get very, very good at the wrong thing. And, you know, there's nothing looks worse on CCTV than, you know, two or three big haymakers coming in. It, it just, it's terrible on every level. And the amount of been assaults that I investigated as a police officer where, you know, 99 out of 100 times, um, the, the offender would, you know, um, break their knuckles. They'd have, you know, parts of the victim's teeth in their, in their knuckles and things. So, you know, they'd be sued for $10,000 to replace their veneers. And then all of a sudden there's the, the bloodborne pathogen disease issue yeah absolutely it's um it, it's, it's an interesting thing right i mean it's, it's striking is is you know it's part of martial arts right we, we shouldn't we shouldn't neglect it uh but i think when it when it's your default response to every situation it becomes problematic especially when you are in a role where you have a greater duty of care uh and where you where you have you know, to be honest a security guard controlling someone a, a bouncer controlling someone evicting someone that's not a self-defense situation Right. In a lot of in a lot of the time we're initiating. We're initiating the contact. Uh, we should have we should, if we're strategically sound, have stacked the odds in our favor. We should be more sober, more vigilant. Uh, we've got teams, we've got plans, we know where we're going, we know what we're doing. Uh, we've used a little bit of an element of surprise. We've approached the person when they're on their own, not when they're with a group of 15. Right. We we're, we're doing all these things that should be stacking the odds in our favor so we don't have to punch them. Right. Uh, Different if you're ambushed, right? If, you, if you're ambushed and you're literally fighting for your survival, as, as I have been a couple of times, um, yeah, I mean, do what you need to do. Uh, but I think sometimes it becomes this, because either people don't have a skill set or that they're not comfortable with the skill set of, of control and restraint other than physical force, which, uh, you know, it, it doesn't go so far until you meet someone who you're not stronger than. Uh, and, and if you, and, and some, sometimes you see, unfortunately, people that just have never dealt with that before and they're, they're just being flailed around the room because they're so desperately trying to get a wrist lock on someone who has been, you know, throwing around sheets of roofing iron for the last 30 years. And it's just not going to work, right? <laughs> that wrist isn't going to bend. It doesn't bend for him. It's not going to bend for you. Um, you know, when, when those sort of situations happen, you see people get this critical focus on the one technique and they end up getting hurt because they, they can't adapt. They've never dealt with it and they're in panic. Um, and, and that's one panic response. It's almost, it's the freeze response. But there's also the panic response of, oh, shit, oh, shit, I'm not prepared for this. I need to start swinging. And, uh, and people start throwing punches, which, yeah, the, arguably a fight response is better than a freeze response. But what inevitably happens, especially uh, in, a, in a crowded club environment, if we're going to use that context, is that it looks really bad. Right? And, and immediately anyone who turns their head to see what the commotion is sees a security guard punching somebody who always looks like the victim right? Especially if you're bigger or you, you look mean or whatever. Uh, that, the, other, the other party always looks like the victim because no one ever sees the start of the confrontation and at the end of it. Uh, and, uh, and now you end up, instead of dealing with one person or three people, you're now dealing with 12 people who all think you're the bad guy. Uh, and it, it just looks bad. Uh, so I think while it's important that we have those skill sets, uh, it's also very important that we're, we're incredibly judicious about when we actually enact them and basically, like, it's not going to get worse, so I may as well use it, right? But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's rough. And, and we see this all the time with, um, it, to bring it out of the security context, even in policing. The second a police officer starts punching or starts dropping knees or starts doing anything that seems excessive, um, it's going to be recorded. It's going to be uploaded. It's going to be investigated. There's going to be all the stuff that's going to happen uh, because usually it's because of a panic i think it's it's because someone is losing control the ego is getting involved they're starting to fear not even not necessarily for their safety but just for the perception uh how often have we seen unfortunate situations where uh, where officers have been trying to restrain someone who's only passively resisting uh mm -hmm. who is just uh, the officers are actually working against each other because both of them are pulling in different directions they can't affect a takedown or they can't get they can't get hands into a handcuff position and they start punching or, or kicking because they're just 
they're humiliated. Like they feel embarrassed, they feel threatened, and then they, they overreact. So one of the things that I like about your book is that you actually talk uh, before you get to the technique section. Uh, and, and my favorite part of books like this, Defensive Tactics for Security Professionals on Amazon. Oh, let me just get there. There it is. There's the, there's the, there's the money shot. Uh, but my favorite part about the, any book like this is the preamble before the techniques. Uh, it's, it's about all the decision-making that's go into choosing the right technique. And one of the things that I really like about your book is that you go into great lengths about managing stress and about, about thinking clearly through your options, use of force considerations. Uh, talk, talk to me a little bit about uh, how you've gone about communicating that from the other side. So you've, you, you had a law enforcement career, you come back in the security industry. It, has that given you a different perspective when it comes to training security guards? Yeah, look, it certainly has. Um, I think it was different going in, going into law enforcement from a security background. Uh, you know, as you mentioned previously, I, I had an appreciation of um, what that job entails. Unfortunately, I think there is still a stigma around, uh, you know, security guards. Um, they are sometimes looked down upon from law enforcement. And I, I think most of the time it's, it's unrightfully so. Um, that, you know, it is a tough job, um, tough job that they're doing minimal training minimal support, um, you know, and it's, it can be a terrifying environment. So certainly when I moved into law enforcement, I had a, an appreciation of that. Um, then coming at the outside, um, leaving law enforcement, you know, back into the security industry. Yeah, yeah I guess, um, you know, a little, little older, a little wiser. And um, yeah, taking all those skills with me as well. Um, I, I don't think they can be underemphasized, those, those communication skills, conflict resolution skills. I think should be at the forefront of forefront of anyone's training. Mm. The, uh, the conflict conflict resolution and, and verbal de escalation training is something that you know, obviously I, I talk about a lot. I I teach it a lot, but my observation is is very different. De escalating someone when you come from a position of authority, like you're actually wearing a police uniform, versus you are coming from a position of really no authority. A security uh, it, taking you out of the club environment because not every security yeah. works in a club, obviously. But if you're just wearing a regular security uniform at a yeah, at a grocery store okay, or or at a uh, in a loss prevention role, you have no real authority. And and the people that are actually going to be your problem children, you know, the, the ones you're going to deal with, they know you have no authority. So you have to de-escalate in a different way. Uh, was that was that a, your your experience in terms of moving from the uh, I guess from a, a civilian role to a law enforcement role and back to civilian? Uh, did you have to change the way you communicate with people? Uh, look, I think uh, certainly, um, you know, as a security officer, you have to probably be a little bit more patient. Um, you know, you, you have time. You're employed at a venue for, you know, until 3 a.m. So you, you're not going anywhere. You have time where, you know, the police are, um, are spread quite thin. You know, you might have, uh, you know, two officers, you know, patrolling a, a huge area with jobs holed up in the list and, you know, they've, They've, they've got to keep moving. So, um, you know, you didn't have that, that element of time, I guess, to, uh, to develop rapport. But certainly, I think, I think at a core level, the skills are much the same. Um, certainly in law enforcement, you know, you're dealing with a, a large percentage of the population who don't respect your authority anyway. So you, whilst you might have it, um, it really means nothing when you're communicating with these people because they don't... Um, respect that authority anyway. So it's, uh, I kind of feel like that puts you back on a, on a similar level as far as one human communicating to another. Um, mm. I think it, it, all the skills of, you know, developing empathy and, and, um, and, and active listening and all those, all the body language skills, I think are, are all quite the same. Uh, I think if you can drill down and kind of get to the why, why a person is behaving the way they're behaving or why they're upset or, or you can get to that why, um, you know, then you're, you're, you're taking steps in the right direction to solving a problem for that person. And I think if you can certainly solve a problem for that person, um, why wouldn't you? Mm, mm. And that's a, that's a fantastic attitude to have. And, and I think um, a, lot of the, a lot of the law enforcement uh, verbal de-escalation or conflict management trainers that, that I've had over the years or that I've, that I've interviewed, uh, those that do it really well are very interested in those human factors of how do I help this person? Uh, how do I how do I help this person who is having uh, withdrawing from a substance, or this person who's under a, a, a tremendous emotional duress because 
whether it's a domestic violence situation or they're, 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 they're homeless or there's a, there's instability or there's a mental health condition, like whatever it is that's going on, how do I help this person through this? How do I connect them with the right service? How do I, how do I convince them that I'm not trying to harm them, that I'm not trying to take away their freedom unnecessarily? Um, those that do it really well have that very strong human connection. And I, I think sometimes what I've seen uh, with non-specialist police that come out and try to do conflict management is that they they haven't really thought about it. how someone who doesn't have the the or else uh, attack like <laughs> you've got a belt full of or else right <laughs> so if you if if verbal de-escalation fails i have contingency <laughs> b c d through f right it's it's all right there uh and and if and if that if that gets overwhelmed then i have a radio that calls for a whole lot more or else that comes later right so mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't have to develop the de-escalation skills as well because you can kind of get away with it. Uh, whereas if we're training a service worker, even our, even leaving a security guard for for the minute, if we're training a service worker who has no or else, who uh, whose or else is a good twenty minutes away, uh, then they're, they're they really need to come back to those human factors of how do we solve problems and how do we uh, how do we acknowledge someone's emotion and how do we help them through whatever the situation is, you know, without making anything more dangerous. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know when I when I first moved into law enforcement, you know, we were told, you know, you you ask them, you tell them, and then you make them. Yep. And that's, you know, I can sort of see where that's where that's spawned from. But um, on the same note, you know, how long do you ask them for? You know, is there a time limit attached to that that request? Um, you know, sometimes I've spent twenty or thirty minutes asking somebody to do something because I've had that time to mm. give them. Um, you know, I think we have to remember that, you know. We're seeing people at their worst, um, in their in their worst day, possibly of their life. And you know, we've all had bad days. Um, we've all had moments where we feel like our world's going to end, and and um, you know, whether we've, we've we've been hit with terrible news or something hasn't gone our way, we've we've all experienced what that feels like to have a bad day, right? Mm. Um, and I think we really need to remember that you know this person is having a bad day also. Um, you know, so. I think certainly that that human element um, has to has to come into play. I, I was fortunate to to I guess kind of um, had this emphasised by by trainer around uh, Lieutenant Kevin Dillon um, from the police lockup system. I was attending training in Minnesota, and he you know um, he, he quite clearly turned to the audience and said, "Look, you know it's great to have a, a you know a, an angled bladed body position when you're dealing with people and stuff, but there's times when you need to turn towards a person and." And face them and have a face-to-face -face conversation. Tell them, look, behind this badge is a heart, and um, you know, and and I can relate to what you're saying. Um, so you know, if it's if it's tactically and operationally safe and sound to do that, you know, we've got to still be able to connect with people on a human level, regardless of what patch we have on our shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, the element of taking time with people is is really important. Uh, I think um, to to my from my my viewpoint on looking and looking back at the security industry in Australia, I, I think uh, we need to spend more time. We need to spend more time on everything, right? There's, there's there's never enough time to prepare someone for for all the reality in a practical you know, time frame. People aren't getting paid to go through an academy, so you can't you can't say, hey, you need to train for six months to take this lowly paid security guarding job. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we do need to spend more time on those human factors. We we need to make sure we have people are communicating with some level of empathy that they understand that. Yeah, the person who's shoplifting isn't always just a, a rat bag who's just doing it for fun. There could be someone who's shoplifting literally for survival, yeah, or or for yeah, uh, and and then there might be a, a lot of embarrassment and humiliation that comes with being confronted about that. Uh, you you could have someone. Yeah, like we, I worked in hospital security, right? You no one's having a good time at two a.m. in an emergency department. Uh, so it, it's, it's, you're going to deal with people that have all sorts of issues. You may even inherit baggage from their previous interactions with police if you happen to have a police-like uniform. Uh, so <laughs> I, I had that because in hospitals, our uniform was literally from the same supplier as the Queensland police uniforms. So the, the only thing that was different was the emblem on our shoulders. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if someone just came in after a knockdown drag out with the police where they were dragged away from their spouse and... Uh, and they've had, yeah, uh, they've got they've got a rap sheet like you know that's longer than their medical records, and uh, and then they meet us. They their immediate connection is more police. Uh, so we we inherited the baggage that came from that, uh, even though we yeah, we didn't care what they'd done. <laughs> like as long as they as long as they were nice to the nurses, that's really all that we cared about. Yep. 
But uh, there's so many pieces of that security puzzle where you don't have the backup. You don't have you, most most security guards don't or in this country don't even carry batons and handcuffs. Um, certainly no firearms. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of pieces to that puzzle where we have to make our guards more emotionally adept at being able to handle those conflict situations responsibly, effectively, uh, without creating undue um, yeah, problems. But but also physically adept, uh, physically fit, physically strong, uh, physically able to manage those situations because the training gap is huge, and they're they're never going to be able we're never going to be able to train them enough on the job. Uh, so they're either going to need to invest in themselves outside of work, like you and I both did with training, uh, or find find positions where they don't need those skills. But it's uh, it's 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 huge, and I, and I think that's one of the main reasons that I'm so happy you wrote this book, uh, Defensive Tactics for Security Professionals, because for those of us out there, and, and and unfortunately it is the minority of the industry. It's a it's a transient industry. People come and go all the time, but for those of us out there that that have committed to making this a career, uh, there there are, there aren't a lot of resources that that are that are geared towards the security profession. Uh, there's a lot of law enforcement stuff, which is very useful. I just had uh, Mark Morales on, who was a co-author of the uh, the book with Lauren Christensen, Defensive Tactics, one of my favorite textbooks on on uh, on defensive tactics. But there's a there's a bit of mental gymnastics that's required to adapt that from a predominantly U.S. policing model to an Australian security industry model. And and I think what you've done with this book, uh, and I'll give you a chance to talk about the impetus behind the book. But I think what you've done with this book is you've really done a great job of bridging that gap between some of the high level training that's available for law enforcement officers, especially with the training you've done in the US and, and uh, the training you've delivered uh, for New South Wales Police to the private security industry and putting it in security industry terminology and 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 mapping across your, your own experiences. And I, I think that's hugely valuable to the industry as a whole. Yeah, thank, thank you, Joe. Um, you know, I, I wrote, I wanted to write the book to, um, you know, it was targeted predominantly to the, for the security industry, but, um, you know, also wanted it to have value to, you know, your, um, your law enforcement officer or your correctional officer or your a nurse or, you know, just, just your average civilian that wants to feel a little bit safer. I wanted them to be able to relate to what was in the book as well. So it was kind of, it was filling a gap. There wasn't something in the Australian, um, you know, that, that specifically targeted the Australian security industry. So it certainly was to try and fill that void, but I also wanted to, um, to, to kind of make it flexible enough that others could, could draw something from it as well. Mm, mm, absolutely. And look, I, I think it's, uh, uh, we mentioned offline, one of the things I really liked about your, your approach in, in terms of the actual physical techniques, because I know there's a lot of people that are waiting to hear about techniques, right? Uh, there's a, uh, what, what I, I went through this evolution, right? And I'll, I'll just share my experience and feel free to, uh, yeah, to add your own, but uh, I went through this evolution where I was fairly naive to, uh, what would actually work in real violence before I started working in, in clubs. I'd, I'd grappled, I'd been a wrestler, I'd been, I'd done judo, I'd done a few bits and pieces that that um, gave me some skill set, but I'd never really applied it against an angry person trying to bottle me. Um, so I kind of just went with the assumption that whatever the security trainers were teaching me was what was gonna work. Uh, and then when the reality is I did 10 reps of that and then three months later was put into a violent situation and asked to practice it, <laughs> asked to actually do it. And of course it didn't work. Right, it, that that technique didn't work. So, I, so I defaulted to what did work for me in the past, which was picking people up and throwing them on the ground. Uh, and um, I was lucky that that was my skill set, not Muay Thai, because uh, I would have just started elbowing people, and that came later. But um, it's it was it was something that I kind of uh, immediately threw out the baby with the bathwater and go, well, wrist locks don't work, or uh, th these control control and restraint techniques they don't work, they're rubbish, uh, and it. It actually was uh, Jim Armstrong, who I know we, we both know. Uh, I went to train with Jim a couple of, uh, actually many years ago now. And um, and he had this this group of guys together that were training. They're all, all you know, black belts and other arts. And uh, he'd created this amazing little melting pot of martial artists that had an open mind. And he was predominantly a combatives guy. And and they were, they were working on wrist locks that month. And I was like, why are you guys doing wrist locks? And, and Jim said to me, as only Jim can, he said, if the technique didn't work, it wouldn't have lasted this long. We've just forgotten how to teach it. We've, we've forgotten how to apply it, what the context is. Like we've just sort of made it this thing where we do it statically and, and it doesn't work because we've forgotten how it was actually supposed to be applied in the first place. Mm -hmm. So 
what I love about your book is that you still have the traditional techniques. You still have a lot, uh, everything, a lot of things that have been adapted from J- Japanese jiu-jitsu and, uh, and, and aikijitsu and, and, and arts like that. But you've also blended in the combat sports approach of having a lot more wrestling stuff, a lot more gross motor skill stuff. Uh, what's, I guess probably is the final discussion point for, for the main interview. I'm curious about your evolution in terms of uh, uh, embracing those sort of gross motor skills. And also, what sort of training time do you think the security guards should be investing in, in getting better at those skill sets if they are working in more hostile environments like, like the hospitality industry? Yeah, look, um, that's a great question, Joe. I think, um, you know, the quality of training certainly plays a part. Uh, as we spoke about before, you can get very, very good at the, doing the wrong thing. So I think it needs to be training that specifically, um, you know, is transferable to the skill set that that particular officer needs. Uh, I've always been very, very particular on, you know, teaching uh, concepts and principles rather than techniques. I think techniques can fail where concepts and principles uh, are generally fairly, fairly sound. So, you know, students within my own classes will be able to attest to this, you know, and I, I openly tell them, I don't want you to do this the way that I do it. I want you to do it how it works for you. So kind of, you know, um, here's the ingredients, but go cook yourself, you know? So I don't get tight bogged down in the details like some systems do where, you you know, your foot has to be 23 and a half degree, degrees angled to the left and you need to grab them with these two fingers here. And, you know, I think that's the least important part. I think being able to understand, you know, the, the, the principles that make that work, um, you know, very, very simple things that you learn in certainly, um, you know, a lot of martial arts, things like relative positioning and, the way that it, you know, the way that a joint works, you know, you can bend, fold, or twist it. Um, you know, body positioning, two points of contact, um, you know, leverage. All these things, I think, are far more important than the actual techniques themselves. I mean, you look at a, you know, you look at a wrist lock. How many ways can you do a wrist lock? There's, you know, I can think of dozens that I could that I can demonstrate you know, ways to do a wrist lock. But ultimately, if you have pressure and counter pressure, and then you have, um, you know, a, a level of pain compliance there. That, that then leads to compliance from that person, your wrist lock was successful. Mm. You know, so does it really matter how, how you applied that wrist lock? As long as it was done safely, um, you know, you achieved the objective that you wanted to, I don't really care which position you have the hand. Um, you know, I think that's the least important part. So that's why all those tactics I put at the, the back of the book, they're just, uh, they're a template, a skeleton to use. I, I, my, my uh, I guess, wish for people is that they go and, and make them their own, um, absorb them into their, their existing skill set, make them work for, for them. Because what works for me might not work for, you know, a, a 50 kilogram female officer um, or somebody that, you know, has, has other, other things happening. So it has to work for the individual and they need to have the freedom to be able to adapt those um, tactics and techniques to, to work for them. Because if it, if it won't work for them, it's useless. So I guess to, to kind of answer your question, what, what time frame do I think is appropriate for people to learn these? It's, it's different for every person. I don't think you, you can put a time limit on it. Um, I mean, I've taught um, seminars, you know, that have gone for days and I've taught sessions that have been as little as half an hour. Um, you know, not to say that the person who I taught for half an hour didn't, didn't gain as much as a person did for two hours. So I guess it depends on the student, um, how quickly they can pick up and retain information, their level of interest, um, their background in, in training, their reasons for wanting to be put in harm's way initially. I think all these factors um, come into play when, when training a, a student, certainly in the law enforcement circles. And I know it's similar in the military because there's so many time restraints. We do this full immersion training. So you'll do, go and do a week course here or a weekend course there and pack as much as you can into that time frame to, um, you know, to utilize the time, which I, I think is, is also wonderful. Um, you know, you can train one night a week for an hour all year, or you can go and do a, a full two weeks in a row. Um, I don't think time really has a great deal to do with um, the, the quality of the learning or the, the, the quality of the retention that the student is gaining. Obviously, there's a level of repetition that needs to occur with that student, but I think that comes down to the, the training process, you know, how that training is delivered and then tested, um, you know, on the tail end of that. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my, I guess probably my, my closing, uh, my closing comment on that, and, and I'm sure you'll echo it, is if you're involved in the security industry, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about Australia or anywhere else. If you're involved in the industry and you are committed to being part of the industry and you're committed to sticking around, and it's not, yeah, and, and no judgment if you're not. I mean, it's 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 not for everybody. Uh, but uh, please invest in yourself. Please actually go out and get good at this because even if you're working in a role where you don't deal with it on a regular basis, you don't deal with violence on a regular basis that's probably even more dangerous because when it does happen, you're not going to have the reps. You're not going to have the experience. You're not going to be able to read the situation as well. If you don't train, you need to make sure that you are ready because those situations, it only takes one to change your life. It only takes one for it to go really bad where you can get hurt or you can go to jail or you can, you can lose your license or you can lose the ability to feed your family. If you don't manage that situation the way that, you know, that, that you should. Uh, so it's unfortunately we, we don't, the industry in Australia is such that most employers aren't going to invest in you. Most employers are not going to send you to a two week training seminar to get better at stuff, right? They, they don't have the resources to do that. They don't have the profit margins to do that. That Yeah. We, we, we're, we're working in a different, different space to law enforcement or military where they can go, where we can sometimes get sent to courses. You need to do that for yourself. And even, even the, the, the best law enforcement officers like yourself that I know that, uh, yeah, that are serious about it. They use their own dime and their own leave to go train, uh, to go get better at the job. And, uh, and I, that's my encouragement to security guards everywhere is don't think just because you did your two weeks or your four weeks or whatever it is that you did to get, to get licensed, that that's where your training stops. If you want to be serious about this and you want to stick with this industry, you need to keep investing in yourself, get as skilled as you possibly can. It'll help your career progression, but it's also going to, it's also like paying for your insurance to make sure that, uh, you prevent that nasty situation from happening as much as possible. Okay. Sorry, Joe, I think I lost you there for a moment. Um, yeah, all good, mate. I, I, we just had a little bit of a freeze, but that's all good. I'll, I'll edit that out. Yeah, uh, yeah certainly to, to echo what you're saying. Yeah, they, these are these are perishable skills. Um, you know, I, I think uh, something I've certainly learned, you know, is is the more that I learn, the less that I know. Um, you know, it's no different to any other, any other skill. It's probably vastly more important than any other skill in that it could save your life. But... Um, you know, it's no different than any other skill. If you wanted to go and learn how to play golf or drive a, drive a race car or, or any skill, um, you need to put in the time, you know. And as soon as you stop putting in that time, you could expect to not, not be on the top any longer. Um, you know, and in this game, um, you know, security law enforcement, we need to be at the top all the time. Um, we need to be at the tip of the spear. And, you know, something that's thrown around a lot is this, this world's best practice. Mm. You know, and I was, I guess, continually uh, changing, uh, sorry, continually uh, challenging that, that notion of what is world's best practice because, you know, training's evolving all the time as well. So, you know, whilst we've been, um, you know, fighting since we were Neanderthals, um, there's only so many ways to punch and kick a person, you know, training concepts and methodologies change all the time. So I think if you're not out there actively seeking out that training and seeking out that knowledge, um, you know, you're really doing those, you protect a, a disservice, in, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely agreed, Matt. All right, that, that's, uh, yeah, that's a great conversation. Uh, Nick, your book is Defensive Tactics for Security Professionals. It's available on Amazon anywhere in the world if you're interested in grabbing a copy. Nick, uh, just give you a quick plug. What, your Martial Arts Academy for anyone who's local and wants to train with you? Yeah, Blue Warrior Martial Arts uh, here in Curry Curry. Um, yeah, please contact me and come on down and have a look. Absolutely. All right, Nick, thanks very much. We're gonna you're gonna hang around and do some bonus questions with us in just a second. But for those leaving us here, thank you very much, Mr. Nick Wyborn. Thank you, Jad. It's been a pleasure. All right, what a great chat that was with Nick. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed catching up with an old friend and having a chat about his book. You can you can grab his book, uh, Defensive Tactics for Security Professionals on Amazon. The link will be in the show notes. That's it for today, and I look forward to talking to you next time.